Hello, everyone, and welcome to Literary Tales. I'm your host, Paul Krauss, and today we will begin a three-episode journey through Dante's Divine Comedy with one episode dedicated to each of the individual poems, the Inferno, the Purgatory, and the Paradise, or Inferno, Purgatorio, and Paradiso. Eventually, we will probably do an episode over the very construction of hell, but that is for another time. In this episode, we will focus on why Dante had to descend through hell before he could begin his journey up Mount Purgatorio and enter heaven. Midway along the journey of our life, I woke to find myself in a dark wood for I had wandered off from the straight path. Thus opens Dante's grand epic of love. But why did the pilgrim poet have to descend into hell, of all places, before he could climb Mount Purgatory and take his seat in the blossoming bud of the white rose of heaven? The Divine Comedy is, in fact, a love epic. It is the greatest love epic. It is the most ambitious love epic ever crafted by the hands of a mere mortal, combining classical antiquity with the Bible, all of the currents of Western civilization found in this most remarkable poem. Dante descends into hell to learn to love again by the most extreme examples of misdirected love, and also through his relationship with his poet guide, Virgil. That there is much depth to Dante is an understatement. There is much allegory, theology, political commentary, reflections on history, poetry, and economics that give life to Dante's brilliant masterpiece. There are many ways to understand the multi-layered world of hell, from its construction to why, at the lowest circle, rather than a fiery pandemonium, as imagined by John Milton, the lake of hell is cold, dark, and frozen. Yet the descent into the abyss, that is the inferno, is perplexing at first glance. When Dante begins his epic, he states that he is having a sort of midlife existential crisis. The poem is about him, but it is more than about him. Dante says that midway along our life, he awoke to find himself in a dark wood because he had wandered off the straight and true path. That straight and true path is the path of love, the love that guides the stars and orders the cosmos. It isn't surprising, given this reality, that the first proper, proper circle of hell is the sphere of lust. Lust is the beginning of misdirected love as evidenced by the pilgrim's discussion with the wounded lusters, Francesca de Rimini and Paolo Malatesta. The two had carried on an illicit affair for over a decade. Francesca, in talking to Dante, subtly blames the poet. It was Dante's romance poetry that had captured the heart of Francesca and filled her heart with erotic intent that ultimately was her own undoing. Dante, nevertheless, takes pity on Francesca and faints. In the conversation between Dante and Francesca, we learn something about the sinners in hell as well as the role of poetry, which is a recurring theme throughout the poem. Francesca had read Dante's love poetry and had misunderstood it to be about the carnal flesh, and, sh and so she lusted after the beautiful and handsome Paolo Malatesta, who also fell in love with the beautiful and seductive Francesca. In their conversation, we should note that Francesca blames Dante rather than accept the reality that it was her own actions that caused her own undoing. And throughout the conversations that Dante has in hell, everybody does not take responsibility for their actions. They always blame someone else. That is because in hell, no one 
can accept the fact that they are responsible for their sin. But in the conversation, we also realize the role that poetry plays in either directing us to the good and the true or in our misunderstanding of poetry, leading us down the path of erotic sin. In the beginning of all three parts of the Divine Comedy, Dante invokes poetry to guide him. O oh, muses, O oh, high genius, help me now, he frantically cries at the beginning of the second canto of the Inferno. Before ascending up the slopes of Mount Purgatory, Dante also invokes the muses again. Here, let death's poetry arise to life. O oh, muses sacrosanct, whose liege I am, and let Calliope rise up and play. By the time he enters into heaven, Dante invokes Apollo, who, beyond being the god of the sun, was also the god of poetry. O oh, great Apollo, for this final task, make me a vessel worthy to receive your genius and the longed-for laurel crown. Dante invokes the muses and gods of poetry in his journey because poetry, up through Dante's time, always had love as its great theme. The epic poetry of Homer, as we covered in our own episodes on Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey, those surrounded by the maelstrom of war, chiefly concerns itself with love. The troubadours of Provence were love bards and poets who set the medieval world aflame, and Dante meets one such troubadour on his ascent up Mount Purgatory. But in the Latin mine, no greater love poet stood out than Dante's own guide through hell and purgatory. Virgil was the chief poet of love in the Roman world. His epic is a grand tale of love which leads Dante through the world that is hell and purgatory, though Dante feels insignificant in comparison. I am not Aeneas, he tells Virgil before journeying to the underworld. Virgil's additional poetry, like the Eclogues, also chiefly concerns itself with love. Omnia vincent amor, as Virgil famously wrote in the 10th Eclogue. Love conquers all. By invoking the muses of poetry and in being guided by Virgil, Dante tips his hand and reveals to the astute reader or listener that the journey into and through hell will require the flowering of love, the love that the poets wrote about. Hell, after all, <coughs> is a loveless place. And Dante's journey is one in which the muses of love must nurture him. The initial relationship between Dante and Virgil is standoffish and cold. While Virgil has been selected by Beatrice, Virgil treats Dante more as an insolent child than a son. Virgil is, at the poem's beginning, more of a reluctant guide than a loving and fatherly guide. He regularly accosts Dante for his stupid questions and repeated mistakes journeying through hell. Dante re repeatedly faints, much to Virgil's chagrin. Two things are missing in their relationship when they enter into the gates, which infamously read, Abandon all hope, ye who enter here. There is a lack of trust between Dante and Virgil. As such, there is a lack of love between the two poets. In fact, the two missing ingredients are also the two missing values that permeate hell itself. Nobody trusts anybody and nobody loves anyone in hell. Moreover, the lack of trust and lack of love are also envisioned as being united together. Without trust, there can be no love, and without love, there can be no trust. While the two poets come closer through their trials and tribulations, the first major transformation in Dante and Virgil's relationship and the journey through the Inferno is one of transformations, is when they are at the gates of the city of Dis. The famous Gorgon Medusa guards the entry. As she approaches the two, Virgil shields Dante's eyes. 
This is ironic for several reasons. First, Virgil had informed Dante not to look at Medusa's eyes after crossing over the river Styx. Virgil has come to care about Dante, as evidenced by the fact that he informed Dante not to look into the seductive eyes of the formerly beautiful Gorgon slayed by Perseus. Dante, we mustn't forget, is still alive, while everyone else in hell is dead. If Dante looked into the eyes of Medusa, he would have been killed. Virgil's reminding Dante not to look into the eyes of the Gorgon was done out of an act of concern, an act of love for the pilgrim poet. Second, the fact that Virgil shielded Dante's eyes also indicates a lack of trust. Despite informing Dante of the deadly powers of the Gorgon seductress, Virgil still places his arm and hand over Dante's face to prevent him from being turned to stone. Dante doesn't fully trust, I'm sorry, Virgil doesn't fully trust Dante not to look into her eyes. Third, and perhaps most ironic of all, the fact that Virgil does shield Dante's eyes indicates his growing love for the poor pilgrim soul, though the two still haven't reached that sacred bond of trust. Again, as evidenced by the fact that Virgil doesn't trust Dante not to look into Medusa's eyes, but yet in shielding his eyes, he displays an act of concern of love for Dante. We should also remember that the ninth circle of hell is reserved for all the traitors who betrayed the trust of their benefactor's country or family, and this will be revisited when they enter into that realm. The lack of trust between the two protagonists is soon remedied. Between Cantos 19 and 21, there is a tremendous, grace-filled metamorphosis between the two men. Yet again, we see another transformation in the poem. Dante makes the growing love exhibited between he and Virgil the central image, in the place of horrifying and pitiable images that permeate these lower rungs of hell. This is, in my view, intentional on the part of Dante. Because they are in hell, and hell is a loveless place, love needs to grow into a burning fire between Dante and Virgil in order for the two to further proceed down the abyss in order to exit hell and begin the long and arduous journey up Mount Purgatory so that they can enter into heaven. In the 19th canto, as the two are in the third bulgia, the eighth circle of hell, Dante is tired on the slopes of the mountain. Yet Dante wishes to have a conversation with one of the damned souls, soon to be revealed as Pope Nicholas III. Exhausted, Dante appeals to his master, becoming father figure. Who is that one, master, that angry wretch, who is writhing more than any of his comrades? I asked. The one over there, licked by a redder flame, and he answered to me, If you want to be carried down along that lower bank to where he is, you can ask him who he is and why he's there. And I responded, My pleasure is what pleases you. You are my Lord. You know that from your will I will not swerve. You even know my thoughts. Here is the first great expression of self-giving and self-sacrificial love in the whole of the Inferno. Moreover, trust between the two is growing, which allows for the self-giving love that binds the two souls together. Virgil takes Dante in his arms and whisks him down the slopes. Then he took hold of me with both, with both his arms, and when he had me firm against his breast, he climbed back up the path he had come down. He did not tire of the weight clasped tight to him, but brought me to the top of the bridge's arch, the one that joins the fourth bank to the fifth, and he gently set his burden down, gently, for the ridge so steep and rugged would have been hard even for goats to cross. From there, another valley opened to me. And note the symbolism in the imagery there, that in this act of love, another valley opened to the two pilgrim poets. 
There is no more fear or distrust in Dante reaching out and asking for Virgil's help. Furthermore, Virgil is no longer incensed at Dante's question and pitiable condition. As the intermediary guide, a sort of in persona Christi, in the journey through hell, Virgil is there to help carry Dante when he is exhausted and cannot continue any longer. Love, as we begin to see in flesh and blood imagery and activity, truly does conquer even the deepest levels of hell. Despite the progress made in loving each other, wherein Virgil has become more of a father to Dante than a mere guide, there is a final barrier to the two to overcome. There is a hidden, invisible wall the two have yet to cross. That hidden barrier is the barrier of forgiveness, that final element of love. The two men have learned to love each other in a self-giving and self-sacrificial way, with Virgil lifting up onto his being, like Aeneas his father, the burden that is Dante. The two have yet to learn the highest value and virtue of love, which is forgiveness. Before they can proceed into the final circle of hell, this incredible literary construction on Dante's part must be realized. The two must learn to forgive each other as the highest expression of their learning to love in order to escape hell. In the 30th canto, that final barrier of learning love is overcome. Dante, the typical childish pilgrim as he is at times in the inferno, begins to dally and waste time absorbed in a debate between two narcissistic sinners, appropri appropriately debating near a pond of water, evoking the image of Narcissus. Virgil is angered by Dante's dallying and accosts him. Dante tells us that in hearing Virgil's anger, he was filled with shame. Upon looking at the face of Dante, Virgil recognizes he has wronged Dante in his outburst of anger. Virgil tells Dante to forget about his outburst and to forgive him. Dante pardons Virgil's outburst in the first and only act of loving forgiveness in the whole of the poem. I was listening, all absorbed in this debate, when the master said to me, keep right on looking a little more and I shall lose my patience. I heard the note of anger in his voice and turned to him. I was so full of shame that it still haunts my memory today, like one asleep who dreams himself in trouble, and in his dream he wishes he were dreaming, longing for that which is as if it were not, just so I found myself unable to speak, longing to beg for pardon, and already begging for pardon, not knowing that I did. Less shame than yours would wash away a fault greater than yours has been, my master said, and so forget about it. Do not be sad. If ever again you should meet up with men engaging in this kind of futile wrangling, remember, I am always at your side. To have a taste for talk like this, vulgar. This moment is important because, as mentioned, it is the only instance of forgiveness in the poem. Had the two not learned forgiveness, they would have been trapped in hell for all eternity. Without a moment of forgiveness, the journey to learn how to love again would have failed. Without forgiveness, Dante and Virgil would have been trapped in the eighth circle of hell forever. Without forgiveness, the, recon the reconciling reality of love, which moves the stars, would have never been revealed. In forgiveness, Dante realizes he has a fatherly figure, always at his side. In Dante's sojourn through hell, the great pilgrim poet learned how to love again. It was his forgetting how to love that caused him to wander from the straight and true and into a dark wood reminiscent of the cold darkness that is hell. Hell is a cold, dark, and loveless place. The only light, warmth, and love that flickered through the nine circles was the love that Dante and Virgil learned in the presence of each other. Having learned love, they conquered hell together and began their ascent up Mount Purgatory with the beautiful stars as their guide.